Welcome everyone from all ends of the earth and those of you who are with us on the internet and those of you who have called in on the conference line. I am so glad you decided to join us. This is Culture of Living Part 6 and my name is Vanessa Treviso. I'm not here to entertain you but to help change you. I'm going to stimulate your mind so that you get God's original ideas and start thinking the right thoughts. So open up your mind and take out your pen and paper and get ready to take some good notes. So we are going to explore the culture of prayer in the kingdom of God. And we're going to learn the pattern for prayer just as Jesus taught his disciples. So I want you to write this at the top of your notes, please. How to pray to produce results. Let me ask you something. How would you like to have all your prayers answered? Hmm? All my prayers get answered. Now, I know that's an audacious thing to say, but I understand the mechanism of prayer and what it is uh, that God wants and what I need to be praying for. So that makes a big difference. And the kingdom of God has a culture of its own. And it has laws and a purpose for existence, just as uh, in the country uh, that you live in uh, also. So prayer is an important part of our kingdom culture. Prayer is uh, giving heaven license to influence earth for the purpose of filling it with God's glory. Prayer invites God into our realm okay, to get him involved with what's happening here on earth, okay? So before we go really into depth about prayer, uh, let's review the purposes of God. So I want you to write this down, please. You're going to have to write fast. First, the Bible is not a religious book. The Bible is about a king, a kingdom, and the king's sons, Okay. The Bible provides material for prayer. Number three, the original purpose of God was to extend his heavenly kingdom on earth. Okay. Make sure you write that down because you need to understand what his original purpose was. Okay. So this has always been his purpose. It still is his purpose and will forever be his purpose. So the purpose of earth was then, point number four, to be the distant colony of heaven. So that's why earth was created. Now, heaven is not your destiny. Heaven is your home country. Earth is your assignment. And that was the purpose of why God created it. He created earth to be inhabited, not to be empty. Okay, So, God wanted to expand his territory from the unseen to the seen, from the invisible realm of heaven to the visible realm of earth. And colonization is the process in which a king expands his territory. So, hence, that's why we have the purpose of earth, was to be that distant colony of heaven. God needed you to expand his kingdom from heaven to earth. And so to do that, you need to be placed in the distant territory. So that's why you're on earth. That brings us to the next point then, number six. The purpose of mankind was to expand God's heavenly kingdom to earth. That's why he created you. God didn't create you to have religion and regulations ran by men. God needed citizens, not religious Christians. You know, he only had angels. And so he made man from his own spirit. And then God created mankind to be his sons who would then administrate his kingdom on earth. And number seven, God's passion was and still is to fill the earth with his glory. And glory is God's heavenly culture. Now, this is the most important verse in the Bible. Genesis 1.26 explains the purpose or the reason why God created you. 
it reveals the purpose for why you were born. You were born to dominate. God created you to rule, to exercise your dominion over all the earth. Let's read this together from Genesis 1:26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. This verse is also critical in understanding the principle of prayer because it defines the relationship that the Creator intended to have with man and the planet Earth. Now, notice that it says, let them have dominion, not let us. God omitted himself. God gave man the legal authority to rule the earth. Heaven is his territory. Earth, the Bible says, he gave to his sons. So our sovereignty on earth is so complete that God himself will not violate it. And this makes prayer necessary because prayer was born out of God's arrangements for our assignment on earth. There is no doubt, though, that we need God. The collective intellect of man cannot solve Earth's problems. This is why we have to go to another source. Okay, so here are a few working definitions to help you understand the nature, the purpose, and power of prayer. Okay, the first one, prayer is man giving God the legal right and permission to interfere with earth's affairs. As you write that down, think about every single word. Okay. As I just explained, God gave man rulership over the dom of earth. This is our domain. So man gives God permission to interfere with what's happening here. Number two, prayer is terrestrial license for celestial interference. Okay, I know those are big words, but terrestrial means earthly and celestial means heavenly. Number three, prayer is man bringing the culture of heaven to earth. Or or not man, but it is bringing the culture of heaven to earth. Okay. Prayer is man exercising his legal authority on earth to bring heaven's influence to earth. Number five, prayer is asking for God's will. You know, we can't pray for God's will if we don't know what it is, all right? So to be effective in prayer, we need to have knowledge of the Lord's will. And the next one, prayer, is communion with God. This is an expression of our unity and relationship of love with God the Father. It's maintaining that oneness with God. And lastly, prayer is essential to living effectively. You know, Jesus told his disciples that they should always pray and not give up. So if we are to always pray, then we must learn how to do this, right? Okay. You know, prayer, ah, prayer, the power of prayer. Nothing is more common and universal to all of mankind than prayer. Yet it is mysterious and misunderstood by the majority. In every culture on earth, prayer exists as a religious expression or experience. You know, but deep in the heart of every human, there is this desire to connect with something, a divine deity for comfort, access, answers, and results. Every religion has some method of prayer, and religious prayer is a global byproduct of religion. The Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Christians, pagans, and heathens all practice some form of prayer. And even the skeptics who aren't sure if it works 
and the many who don't believe it's necessary will even say a prayer. You know, the First Lady of the United States opened a presidential rally and said a prayer as she read the Lord's Prayer out loud in public. The President of the United States does it. The Prime Minister of India does it. And even the Queen of England does it. You know, people say things like, well, I'll say a prayer for you. Have you heard that? Or, you're in our prayers. And they say this when they see someone that is struggling. These phrases have become so cliche. But this is evidence that people do not understand how to pray. Most people don't pray at all, except in a moment of crisis or in a life or death situation. Why? Because even if they believe in prayer, it doesn't work for them. The smallest meeting in the church is the prayer meeting. Why? People don't go. They would rather watch their favorite Monday night TV show than to do something that isn't giving them results. And the pastor only shows up because they're the pastor. People attempt to pray to God to get things, treating him like a vending machine. Now, what happens when you put your money into the machine and it doesn't return anything? The machine ate your money without dispensing anything and suddenly you're frustrated. Now, how likely are you to trust the machine to put more money in it and try again? Now, chances are, if, you, if you've done this before, you got the same result, right? Nothing. Nada. Sigh. Hmm. Now, those who are busy praying without results are kicking the machine in fear, frustration, and utter disappointment. There's nothing wrong with God, though. <laughs> we just don't know how to pray. The problem is we don't understand the purpose of prayer and its power. Prayer has nothing to do with religion. It is not something that you say or practice necessarily, but prayer doesn't just happen automatically. Point number three is prayer must be properly taught. We must learn how to pray. Because point number four is prayer is an art. And number five, prayer is a lifestyle. So the secret to Jesus' success in his ministry was a lifestyle of prayer. In fact, it is the only thing that his disciples asked him to teach them. And they were smart. They saw their teacher doing this one thing more than anything else. He would spend hours with the Father and minutes with man. Prayer done the right way is the key to living effectively. Understanding prayer takes a great deal of work. And it begins with understanding the purpose of prayer. Everyone say purpose. Purpose is the reason for the existence of a thing, right? Well, there's a reason for prayer. Number one, write this down, please. Prayer is participation in the purposes and priorities of God. Number two, prayer is acknowledging God and asking him to accomplish his will in the earth. Number three, as Dr. Miles Monroe defines prayer as earthly license for heavenly interference. Earthly license for heavenly interference. As we saw earlier, it's man giving heaven license to impact earth. And number four, God handed over the management of earth and the administration of his government in the earth to his human helpers. Okay. So you have the authority to change what's happening on earth. Heaven needs you to give it license to impact it. And this is because of how God arranged and purposed everything in accordance with his purpose. 
and his priorities. You know, prayer is your function. It's natural to pray. It's an integrated part of your purpose. Now, consider the wings on a bird. Now, look at the picture here. This is a beautiful bird paradise. The creator designed every detail of the bird according to its purpose, down to the intricate shape of its feathers, its wingspan, and even its tail. So God designed you with the ability to commune and communicate with him while you are here on earth. The kingdom is your connecting link with God and your home country of heaven. So we depend on Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit as our intermediaries with God. So prayer is necessary to fulfill your earthly assignment. Now, there's also a purpose for your body, okay? The human body is purpose for life on earth. The purpose of your body is your legal house for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit so that you can stand on earth and give God earthly license for heavenly interference. So when God formed man's body from the same material as earth, and then he infused the man's clay vessel with his own spirit, (laughs) and that's when he blew into man's nostrils the breath of life. And so then the Bible says, then he became a living being. So God gave that dirt body life. This is why Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. The Holy Spirit, who is the governor of God's kingdom, actually lives inside of you. So your physical body is so important. That's why Satan's agenda to kill, steal, and destroy makes it attack on your health. Your body is what makes you legal on earth. A spirit without a physical body is illegal. So your physical body is what gives you legal authority on earth. You can't rule from the grave. (laughs) You need your body. So this is why you have to take care of it. So you have to live clean in your body. And you've got to protect yourself by obeying God's laws. And also develop healthy habits, including a prayer habit, which we will talk about. If you live right, you'll live long. Everyone say that out loud. Live right, live long. So, you know, make sure that you take care of your body. See, when you understand the purpose of it, you'll see the value of your body. And when you value things, what do you do? You protect them, right? You protect your valuables, right? So you got to protect your body. We are designed to live in accord with God's principles and in obedience to his commandments. This is our natural position in our relationship with God. God wants you to learn how to obey him in everything. So always keeping yourself in check with him and his word. I'm telling you, you won't make it unless you get this because your life depends on it. You have the will to decide how obedient you are that you will be with God. So God wants to bless you and prosper you. It requires that you have a daily relationship with him. And God then helps you grow in your obedience in the boundaries of his grace as you mature in your knowledge and faith. The psalmist King David said, I run in the path of your commands. See, he understood the benefits of listening and obeying God's commands. Now, when I say obedience to God's commandments, I'm not referring to the Ten Commandments or any other set of commandments found in the Bible, but rather the foundational commandments of God. Now, these come from the earliest commands of God 
of what God gave the first man. And we can see this here in Genesis 128. When God charged the first humans, Adam and Eve, with the dominion assignment, he was speaking to all of us. The entire species of mankind was locked inside the loins of Adam. So when we read this, God is speaking to you. All right? Read this out loud with me. From Genesis 1:28. Go. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is our Adamic administration, our dominion or management mandate. Okay. Dominion is an assignment and a program. The purpose for the assignment was to accomplish the purpose of God, which was and is, do you remember? To extend his heavenly invisible kingdom from the unseen realm to the physical seen realm of earth. So from the celestial to the terrestrial, to bring his kingdom from heaven to earth. Dominion is God's program for our existence on earth. God gave human beings responsibility over earth. And as I said, it's, it's our, this is our management mandate. I want you to write that down. Okay. You're here to manage. Or another word for manage is stewardship. So God gave us responsibility to be good managers. God has given every single individual an assignment. Your assignment is your purpose. And this is why it's important that you understand dominion. And these first commandments, these foundational commands that God gave us. God wants us then to look to him for our day in and day out guidance. Taking our marching orders from him on the throne. And this is why prayer is so significant for the achievement of our assignments because prayer is our communication with God and the government of heaven. Prayer touches the Father's heart. You know, with all his power and majesty and everything he has to rule, he stops to listen when his children pray. Come and hear. All you who fear God, let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would have not listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. God listens to his children. Look at this one from 2 Chronicles 7.14. Read this with me. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. How about this one from 1 Peter 3.12? For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But then look at what it says next. For the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. God turns an attentive ear to the prayers of the righteous, and he delivers them from their struggles. That's this verse here, Psalms 34, 17. When the righteous cry out, the Lord hears them and he delivers them from all their troubles. So God will always show you the way out when you stand right with him. He hears. Righteousness 
means our hearts are right with God. Only the one with clean hands and a pure heart may stand in his presence. Read this with me from Psalm 24, 4. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Jesus also said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So see, when we talk about being pure in heart, Jesus wasn't referring to dying and going to heaven to see God. He was talking about the attitude that we are to live by every day and when we pray right, as well, that when our hearts are pure, it means that our minds are on the things of God and his ways. So everyone say the righteousness. The righteousness. Here's why. Righteousness is so important to our prayer lives because without it, as we are learning, God will not listen. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Okay, so now listen, if your relationship with God is broken, your effectiveness in prayer will be broken. Effectiveness has to do with the righteousness. It's repairing the unity with God. This is why we can't be casual about sin. Okay? Because it interferes with our relationship with God. It interferes with every part of our lives. And especially our prayer lives. So God wants to answer our prayers and bless our socks off. He wants to bless you so badly. That's why he has to tell us repent of our sins. Because then when he says he forgets, he forgets forever. Nothing can stop what God has for you except sin. No barrier, no door, no Pharaoh, nobody. Nothing will block the blessings the opportunities, the promotions, the advancement, the prosperity. Except sin, right? Only you prevent your own success. So let me tell you. Now, I want you to write these things down here. Righteousness, as we've learned, means that your heart and mind uh, is, is pure and your hands are clean. Okay. Righteousness is hard work. Okay. It requires daily monitoring of our thoughts and behavior. The righteousness means right standing with God and what he says. Right standing is what keeps iniquity from corrupting our lives. Iniquity is invisible sin. Write this down, please. For example, lust is an iniquity, greed, hatred, or jealousy. All of those are what we call invisible sin. Now, these sins lead to this iniquity, this invisible sin, is what leads to actions of sin. So it's actually worse than physical sin because it's secret sin. And it interferes with our ability to commune and communicate with God. So we need holiness to stand before God. Why? Because he's holy. Okay? So it's in that special sacred place that God meets us. And holiness simply means to be one. It means that you are one with yourself. And it denotes the state of being integrated. Integrated comes from the same word as integrity. So it it means that Whatever you say, believe, and do all line up. They're all the same. So God has integrity. He keeps his word. God is holy and righteous. So holiness and unholiness cannot exist together. So this is why true prayer is maintaining oneness with God. It's being integrated. Right? That's holiness. And I, you can even think of the word whole. From holiness. 
It makes you complete. Integrity is important. And integrity is what we've lost. Integrity is rare, is it not? Yes. But it is a requirement. Okay? You want to have integrity in your heart, not iniquity. Okay? So this is a requirement for prayer. We have to remain obedient to God and follow his instructions so that we can be integrated with him. Obedience protects our oneness with the Father. Proverbs 28, 9 says, If anyone turns a deaf ear to my instructions, even their prayers are detestable. Now, the word detest or despise here doesn't mean to hate. It means to ignore. It simply means God doesn't listen. So anyone who prays to God but doesn't obey his words receives no response. See, if you ignore God's law, he ignores your prayers. John 9, 31 says, We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. So, again, you've got to have knowledge of what his will is so that you can do it, right? All right. So you can't do God's will if you don't know what it is. So this is important uh, to understand. Also, another scripture uh, from the book of Psalms says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. There's another one. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. I like that. The upright have found knowledge. Their prayers delight God. The upright in heart have God's attention even before they pray. As the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord are always on the righteous. Okay. So this is important. If I want to say this. You know, most people pray because they're trying to get God's attention. I want to tell you something. You already have God's attention. He's just trying to get you to understand what his intentions are for you. And when it comes to prayer, no amount of crying or making a lot of noise, no whooping and hollering will get God's attention. Emotions don't move God to act. Obedience does. You know, consider the Israelites. Every time they disobeyed God, they lost battles. And when they were in alignment with the kingdom government, the Lord was with them, and they won every single battle. So when they disobeyed God, they lost. When they returned to him, the Bible even says that he paid no attention to their tears. What happens when you're in crisis? That's when you go crying out to God, right? So they came back and they wept before the Lord, the Bible says, and he paid no attention to their weeping and he turned a deaf ear to them. Why? Because they disobeyed him. Now, consider Abraham. The Bible says Abraham's faith was credited to him as the righteousness. Okay, Righteousness has to do with right standing. So Abraham's right standing is what reconnected him with the government of heaven while he was standing on earth. That was his key to communication. The righteousness is about the relationship with the authority. So Abraham had the relationship that then gave him authority. Okay, He had relationship with the authority, the ultimate, that gave him authority on earth. So there was even a time he negotiated with God to save the people in Sodom. So he actually influenced God okay, in his negotiation with him. Why? Well, because he had the right to and the privilege to because of where he stood with God. So you also have the power to influence God. You know, the church has done its job to teach us that we are weak and unworthy. 
But that's not true. The Bible says that we are to come boldly, that we can approach the king of heaven as he is our daddy. So when you know where you stand with God and his government, you can be bold in your prayers. You can walk confidently knowing that he hears you. The Bible also teaches us that we are to pray without ceasing. It says rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So what does it mean to pray without ceasing? That means you don't stop. So look at Ephesians six eighteen. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. So we are to be constantly, continually pray God's thoughts. And that's what you're doing when you pray in tongues. So pray when you wake up. Pray when you're in the bathroom. Pray when you're in the kitchen cooking dinner. Pray when you're in the car. When you're at the store, when you're on the job, pray without ceasing. Pray in the spirit. Pray in your mind. you got to think on the kingdom and God's will all the time. It says to always keep on praying. Always keep on praying. So, <laughs> prayer is so important because it is essential to our purpose. Number one, everything you need to fulfill your purpose is available through prayer. And your purpose is the key to your fulfillment in life. So this is why we need to understand prayer and how to do it correctly so that you can fulfill your purpose, right? Get everything that you need to, which includes, uh, number two, God then provides through prayer, he gives his saints guidance, wisdom, and discernment for the fulfillment of his purposes and will. And number three, when you spend time with God, he reveals what he wants you to do next. So that's important because especially, you know, when you get into that, that moment, that time, there's a situation or your circumstances change and you're wondering, what should I do? What's the next move? And this is why, uh, especially in times of crisis, okay, boys got to look to the master and, you know, as you're picking up pieces uh, you know, before you, you construct anything, before you go and build anything, you got to look to the master builder first to get the strategy, right? To get the, the blueprints, right? So uh, this is why the mechanism of prayer, and I use the word mechanism because it, it, it is like a machine or it's like a, you know, it's, a fun- it's the way it functions, okay? And it's important to the outcome of your success uh, in every situation. So as we just even saw in that previous scripture, that we are to pray, we are to rejoice, to pray and give thanks in all circumstances. This is why prayer is important. Everyone say prayer. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The King James Version says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I like this verse. (laughs) So, okay, here's what we can learn from this. I want you to write this down, please. If we are to be effective in prayer, then we need to be fervent in our prayers. Fervent means intensively heartfelt. So it's like a fever. It causes excitement. And I believe that this is actually related to that tingling 
feeling that we experience sometimes while praying in the spirit. Right? So fervent, uh, translated in Greek, is the word energo. Okay, you can see the word energy in there, right? It comes from the word en, which means engaged in, and ergon, which means work. So prayer engages us as we are actively working in partnership with God to get results. Okay? So that we can fulfill that original purpose of God, which is what? What was it? To bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, right? So, in short, this means that the prayers of the righteous are efficient. Efficient means that they are achieving the maximum productivity with minimum effort. I like that. That's good, isn't it? So, Jesus demonstrated that prayer is the most important part of our work. Hmm. Because he spent more time with the Father in prayer than he did doing anything else. If you read carefully, if you go through the four Gospels and study his life, you'll find that he would get up really early in the morning before the sun would come up, before sunrise, and he would go into a place and he would spend time with, with the Father, and he would pray. So while everyone else was sleeping, he was doing his greatest work. Prayer gets God involved in our lives, and it brings him into our situation. So when we make urgent requests, and then we have to wait for the answer. We're going to wait on the Lord for the vision or the revelation is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Now, tarrying doesn't mean to sweat and fret, okay? To tarry simply means to wait. It says, for an appointed time, meaning God designated a time for the revelation to arrive. And when we mean revelation, it's referring to the revelation knowledge. Okay. This is the answer. Okay. And it can only be revealed through God's spirit. So now when we think about the word appointed, appointed time. If you make an appointment with the dentist office, that means that you decided ahead of time when you're going to see the dentist. So God is making a promise that the revelation is sure to come. It will not delay because he already designated the time when it will come. He, that's already decided. So just wait. Don't panic. Don't get depressed. Wait. This is why you can see throughout the Bible, the Lord is always telling his saints to wait. Wait on the Lord. Just wait. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. You know, you think about, think about Abraham. God gave him a promise. And he had to wait for it to come. God was faithful, wasn't he? But what he was looking for were Abraham had his faith, right? If he believed, right? So the promise came after the wait, but God already had designated, he already decided when that was going to be fulfilled. And so then Abraham just had to wait, right? And it Surely had come, right? He got his son, right? So I want to ask you this. Do you ever feel like you're praying and God isn't listening? 
You know, are you unsure of where you stand with him? Are you unclear about how to pray and what to pray for? Well, no more kicking the vending machine, okay? So what we're going to do is when we get back together again for class, we are going to learn the right way to pray just as Christ taught his disciples. And so he actually uh, gave us the Lord's Prayer, uh, which actually really isn't the Lord's Prayer, but it's a pattern for prayer. And so we're going to study that in depth uh, when we get back together for the second part of this session and uh, to help us understand exactly how we need to be praying so that we are effective. So we have to, one of the things that we learned today is we have to pray with the right attitude. We got to get our hearts right. Got to get our minds set in the right place when we're praying. And I hope today change the way you think about prayer as prayer is heartfelt expressions shared in communion with our father and you can have a relationship of love with god as your father as your abba and know his will and purpose for your life because he desires the same relationship with you that he had with his son jesus So I want to encourage you today to make a decision to spend more time with him. Make it a habit to pray and to read your Bible every day. Spend at least an hour a day in private prayer. Seek intimacy with God as your father. You know, when you intentionally spend time with him, he then shares his heart with yours. And so I want to challenge you over the next few weeks, Start praying with the right attitude and requesting God's interests and desires, right? So, well, let's do this as we close. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you said, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Father, this promise that you have given us that we can call to you and ask you to show us great and unsearchable truths about prayer that you have set forth in your word. We ask you, Father, to forgive us for leaning on our own understanding when it comes to prayer. Forgive us for leaning on our religious upbringing Heal us from the spiritual and emotional effects of unanswered prayer. What that has done to us in our lives, Father. Give us open minds and hearts to hear your word, Father. And allow you to teach us through your Holy Spirit, Father, the purposes of your kingdom. And so that we may understand our role in your kingdom and master the art of prayer so that we can be effective in our assignments here on earth and we just pray this in the name of jesus amen